Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul is giving instruction, or rather reminding the church in Corinth about some instruction he had previously given them on the Lord's Supper. And he tells them in verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 11, a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. When we come to communion, the Lord's table, we examine ourselves and we say, Lord, is there anything between you and me? Is there any fracture in fellowship? Is there a break in communion? Is there anything in my life which is displeasing to you? Matt Bowring and Lydia Lang sing, Nothing Between My Soul and the Savior. Nothing between my soul and my Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine, there's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and my Savior, so that His blessed peace may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Cheats away clear, there's nothing between. Nothing between, like worldly pleasure. Habits of life, no harmless they seem. Must not my heart from him ever sever? I am resolved there's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and my Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear that nothing between. Nothing between my pride or station. Self or friends shall not intervene. tribulation I have resolved there's nothing between nothing between my soul and my Savior so that his blessed peace may be seen nothing preventing the least of his favor keep the The Bible has the answer. You have provided the questions, and we search God's holy word in order to find the answers. Question number one, what is the difference between disciples and apostles? I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 8, 9, and 10. In chapters 8 and 9, you will see that Matthew, as he is writing this account, he uses the word disciples. Now, he uses it both coming from the mouths of Jesus' opponents. He says, your disciples, Jesus, 
And Matthew uses it himself in reference to the disciples. And he also refers to the disciples of John the Baptist. Then there is a change which takes place at the beginning of Matthew chapter 10. And let me read that. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples. Now, a disciple is one who has been called, who is following after a master. And they are under discipline. They are learning. They are being tutored, that is. They are in a course of study, you may say, uh, though it may not be a formalized study as a university class. But yet there is training that is taking place. There is a discipline that is being learned, that is being taken on in their life. So Jesus, he summons his 12 disciples. There were others that Jesus had, but the 12, most especially, they had a front row privilege, and Jesus most especially pours into them. He summons the 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, these unclean spirits, and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now the, now the names of the 12 apostles here, Matthew changes the word. He doesn't use the word disciples. He says, now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The word apostle, though in the New Testament we may come to think, well, that's a very specialized word. It was a common word in the first century Greek world. And the word apostolos simply means one who is sent with a message. And there was a verb that went along with it, I send with a message this person, whoever may it may be. So. An apostle was someone, it could be a political message, it could be a military message, but an apostle was simply one who is sent with a message. In Hebrews, we read that Jesus himself is God's apostle into this world. He is our high priest and he is an apostle to this world. But Jesus here, after Matthew speaking of the 12 disciples, and that is exactly what these were, Jesus is then calling to himself and naming them apostles. For as you continue to read, you see that he is sending them out two by two, and he is now giving them instructions. And so here, these disciples, they had come and learned, and they would most certainly come back and learn much, much more and experience much under the tutelage and under the hand of Jesus. But here they're being sent out, and this is what is taking place here. So a disciple is one who is learning, and each and every one of us, we are the Lord's disciples. We are to learn of him, and we are to become like him. But then we have this word that we are sent out, and that is what Jesus did with these, especially the 12 apostles, as well as the apostle Paul, who had seen the Lord. But here we have disciple, one who comes to learn, apostle, one who is sent out, and sent out with a message, and there was no more glorious or urgent message than the message of the gospel, which Jesus put in the hands of these men to change the world, both at this particular juncture, as they went out to the villages of the Jews, as well as in subsequent years, as they would go to the far reaches of the world to proclaim Christ. Question number two, why would someone choose to get baptized? There are three very simple reasons for why someone would choose to be baptized, and they are simply, all, all of them, are in direct response and in direct obedience to what the Bible has to say. First of all, someone would want to be baptized 
as they follow Jesus, uh, Jesus example, first of all. And here we have it in Matthew chapter 3 that Jesus comes to the Jordan to John the Baptist and John tries to prevent him and says, Lord, I, I have need to be baptized by you and you come to me. And Jesus says, permit it at this time for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. If Jesus was so eager himself to fulfill all righteousness, why would we not also want to take this step of following our Lord and Master in the waters of believers' baptism? Secondly, in Matthew chapter 28, here we go from one end of the Gospel of Matthew to the very other end, and the concluding words of Jesus, which Matthew uses as a sign off, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He gives a command to his disciples, teach them, instruct them, baptize those who come to faith in me through the gospel, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus gives the command, and if these disciples, these apostles, are to be obedient to that command, they need people to baptize, those who have come to faith. And so that's you and that's me. Number three, we have the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6. He speaks of believers' baptism as identification with Christ. And here in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? And he goes on to explain that more. If we are to identify with Christ, to identify with his church, here is one of the most powerful means of that identification that we would want to be as our master, that we would want to be baptized into his glorious death, that death by which we are saved, by which we are freed from the penalty and the shame, the debt of our guilt, of our sin, that we would rejoice in him. We are baptized because we follow Jesus' example. We, fought, we are in obedience to Jesus' command and we delight in identifying with our Lord and Master as well as His glorious bride, the Church. Thank you for these questions. If you have a question, send it to us. Our mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. Heidi, Dorothy, Betty Ann, and Lois, a ladies' quartet, sing all for Jesus.
Faith to Live by Resources has just released another brand new CD of 13 songs for your blessing. We've entitled it, Look for Me Around the Throne. All of the music which we are including on today's broadcast are taken from this new CD and we would love to send you a copy. As with all of our resources, these things are always sent free and postage paid without any obligation whatsoever. We simply want to extend the ministry of Faith to Live By in this way that you might listen to it or read where there are books that you might have these things to enjoy and be blessed by aside from the times of our broadcasts. Look for me around the throne. Ask for it when you write this week to Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. You may also call us toll free 1-833-367-3852. Also, our website, Faith to live by .ca has a means of you contacting us that we might mail a CD to you, or you can go there and immediately download the music files from this new CD and browse previous CDs that are there, all of the music files that you may also download those and have them for your blessing on your tablet or phone or computer whatever the case may be. Just before the message, Tim Sturby sings Sweet Beulah Land. Someday on oh, 
the confident hope that the believer in Jesus Christ has of life everlasting and of a dwelling in heaven for all eternity is something that has for 2,000 full years encouraged and blessed and strengthened the children of God. And the last two chapters of the New Testament and the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation chapters 21 and 22, have been like a beacon, like a trumpet call, loud and clear, encouraging men and women to hold fast in the midst of difficulty. It was for this very reason in the first century that the Lord gave the book of Revelation. Many wonder about Revelation and they see things that are strange and puzzling. They are, they're things that they say, I am mystified by what I read here and by the great monsters and the beasts, things that take place in the future, and I am frightened by them. The first century believers they were hard pressed. Many of them had died. Some of them were in the process of being put to death. They needed something to hold on to, and God gives them this word. He gives them a clear understanding that though the devil rages as a lion, though he goes about like that lion seeking men and women to devour, that those who hold fast those who hold fast, not by their own efforts, but by faith in the Son of God, who has loved them, who has come into this world to give his very lifeblood for them, that they will be rewarded for their faith with a dwelling that goes beyond imagination, it goes beyond anything that this world could possibly offer in pleasure or privilege or in other types of rewards. The Apostle John, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. The sea was something from which terrors emerge. And he says, there's no terrors in this place. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Beautiful, beautiful. And he no, not only sees, but he hears, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle, that is, the dwelling place, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. You remember that in Matthew's gospel, we have the declaration that we also have coming from Isaiah's prophecy that Jesus, his name would be Emmanuel, God with us. Here once again, we have Emmanuel, God for all eternity, not just for about 33 years of Jesus being in this world, but here for all eternity, God's dwelling would be among his own people. And God himself will be with them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death, no cancer wards, no funeral directors, no funeral services, no caskets, no funeral entourage, no cemeteries. There will no longer be any death. There will be no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne and here is a declaration of power. You see, as we have come to this point, the devil has been fully and finally conquered, absolutely. He has been stripped of his power, as most assuredly he will be stripped. He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful 
and true, faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give, here is a gift, I will give to the one who thirsts from the strip spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. How do we overcome? We overcome by our trust, our confidence, and our delight in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to those who delight in him, he will reward with life everlasting. Oh, come and look to him. Rejoice in the cross of Calvary where he paid your debt and know that his death gives you life and come to rejoice in that today and every day. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Thank you for joining Pastor Barbara today. Please watch for Faith to Live By again next Sunday at this same time on this same station. Until then, Faith to Live By prays that the peace of God will fill your heart and that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Pastor Barbara would love to hear from you. The mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. 